Welcome to Insight. Today we are chatting with Morris Vogel, president of the Tenement Museum in Lower East Side, Manhattan. Housed in an 1863 apartment building that was home to over 7,000 immigrants, the Tenement Museum preserves the history and stories of those who settled and lived in this iconic American immigrant neighborhood. Morris has generously agreed to share some of his experience with us. I'd like to thank you, Morris, for joining us today. Thank you. The history of the United States is embodied in many respects in this museum. Talk about the Tenement Museum and the impetus for its founding. There was long the notion, the one that I grew up with when we studied this country's history, that its founding narrative, that really its, its core story, was one that we'd associate with Plymouth Rock or Independence Hall, with Gettysburg, with, with the West. And that was the, the dominant story in this country's history for, for many years. What the museum was about was an effort to deepen and enrich that story, to make clear just how important immigration has been in shaping this and making us the people we are, and to tell that story in the place that we associate with the waves of hundreds of thousands, ultimately millions of immigrants uh, from Europe, the, the, the homes they made uh, on, in, in New York, uh, that New York's story is the American story, and the story of immigrants is the American story. And the history of, of America is really a, a history that unfolds in eras. Before the waves of immigration from Europe and from Asia, there were the various Native American groupings, the various tribes who had their own history, much of it uh, now lost and in the process of being rediscovered. There was the, the founding uh, group of European immigrants who came here and tried to establish colonies, sometimes successfully, sometimes not so successful. There was the revolutionary period. We go up through now increasing waves of immigration, first in rural areas and then in places like Manhattan. And this is the history that you're telling. It is. And indeed, history is a process of constant rediscovery of the past. So every moment rewrites its past. Every moment. The, the, the challenge for every moment is to determine how we got to the place we are, how we better understand what our options are going forward. So the Tenement Museum grew out of that uh, one such moment, the, the, the moment of, of civil rights, the idea that America, America's strength depended on its inclusiveness, dependent on its willingness to, to, to see, to understand, to appreciate just how many peoples had made this the country it was. And indeed, that's a story that even now is being rediscovered. The Tenement Museum story, very much focused on European immigration. Right now, we at the Tenement Museum are discovering ways to, to deepen and enrich that story so that it explains why New York today looks the way it does, why it has so many, uh, so many of its, its citizens, so many of its residents originate in, in, in East Asia or South Asia or Latin America or Africa. And so history doesn't, uh, history doesn't come to a, a close point. History continues to, to rediscover what it is that matters to the time in which we live. Talk about the physical uh, scale of, of the museum and how it is laid out. The museum is the smallest uh, national park in the United States. We're uh, an affiliated National Park Service site on a postage stamp of a 25 foot by 70 foot city lot. Uh, a building that went up, as, as you said before, in, in, in 1863, that's six stories. Uh, it had uh, 22 apartments, each 350 or so square feet, and a saloon in the front when, when, when it, uh, on, on the basement level when, when it opened. Uh, it's in those apartments, uh, many less than the size of what we would today think of as a, a, an appropriate room. Uh, for, for uh, in a home. In those apartments, uh, 
families of 6, 8, 10, 12, 15 people live, sometimes with borders as well, sometimes with a sweatshop uh, occupying the, the parlor when the, the borders weren't sleeping there. Uh, the, uh, those spaces were on heat, did not have central heat. Uh, most rooms didn't have windows to the outside. There was no plumbing. There were no utilities. Plumbing was added in the early 20th century. And yet it's by going into spaces like that, hearing the stories of the people who live there, more than hearing them, coming, uh, appreciating what kinds of dreams brought people into circumstances like this, what kinds of struggles they encountered, what kinds of aspirations they maintained, what kind of life they were able to build for themselves and their families. By doing that, we understand immigration not just as a set of facts. We understand immigration not just as a, a group of stick figures that march across our American landscape, but we understand it emotionally as well as intellectually. And by the way, that's one way that we're able to, to take the story of immigration. Immigration is a fraught issue. Uh, in, in, in the American It has always today. been a fraud issue. It's even more now than it has been at, uh, at any moment since the, the 1920s. Uh, and we're able to take an issue like immigration and by giving it a human face, uh, the, the face of one family or two families or, or, or dozens of families, but the face of families, the face of individuals, we're able to say to our visitors, and we get well over 200,000 visitors a year, that you've got skin in this game. These are people like you. They may have come from a different place. Uh, they may have encountered different circumstances than you do in your life, but there's a, a, a superficial set of differences that separates you from them. Strip away that very skin-deep mask of difference, and underneath there are people just like you, with dreams just like yours, with, with hopes for their children that very much match yours. That's the story of immigration. That's been the story of immigration in this country for generations. And what you're saying is that this is not a museum of the past. This is, mu this is a museum of the past, but it is also the, a museum of today. It is a museum that basically tells the story of so many immigrants today who are in this country who are working and striving and trying and living in very, very cramped spaces throughout this country who do not necessarily have access to all the benefits of others around them who look around and see my life could be better. And these are the exact same stories that inhabit the tenants of the Tenement Museum through all those years. Very well said, indeed. Uh, our educators, and you visit the museum with an educator uh, in a small group, our educators work very hard to, to really uh, uh, to help erase the distinction between past and present. They, they begin in the present. They help visitors understand that, that immigration is a dynamic process. And, and for example, uh, we draw over 50,000 uh, public school students through every year. Uh, to the extent those students come from New York, they're them, themselves immigrants and the children of immigrants. They come from Asia, from Africa, from Latin America. We tell them stories that until now have focused very much on Europeans. And it's our, we have the, uh, just a wonderful opportunity uh, to show them how little real, how little fundamental difference there is between their experience and the experience of the stories that we tell. We want very much, of course, to bring the story into the present. And, and that's what our next uh, project is about, is to, to, to add as well apartments that tell the story of, of Chinese and, and Latin American uh, immigrants who, who made lives in this country in the years after World War II. How did the Tenement Museum, the idea for the Tenement Museum, take seed? take root and, and, then, and then grow? 
Well, part of it was a, a brilliant founder, uh, Ruth Abram, uh, who, whose background was in social work, uh, but who, w and, and because of that, was very much interested in, in a, a, a presentist, a present day approach to the past. She and her uh, colleague, partner, Anita Jacobson, the co-founder, were looking for a place on the Lower East Side to, 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 to set up an office so they could offer walking tours. And, and they came upon this building. Anita walked deep into its, uh, its interior spaces and discovered a time capsule. The building had been uh, shuttered in 1935. It had been condemned by the city of New York as unfit for human occupancy. So very little had changed inside the building, and they saw very quickly uh, just how useful it would be to open this time capsule, bring people back to, 18, to, to 1935, and then beyond that, bring them back earlier and earlier, all the way back to, to 1863. And, and over time, uh, the museum has uh, uncovered the stories of different families using the, using the historic record, uh, using memory, uh, using the material spaces themselves, uh, scraping down through, not scraping, but very carefully, removing 30 uh, coats of paint and wallpaper to see what the spaces looked like at given moments when different people uh, lived in those spaces. So in many respects, it's an archaeological endeavor. It is a uh, matter of research into uh, into history, into the history of families, into the history of individuals. It is a um, exploration of different cultural eras through the experiences of the tenants in there. We use the best in scholarly research, whether it be archaeological or uh, historical inquiry into the, in, into the, the, the social uh, record. Uh, and we apply that in order to develop stories that we can share effectively. The visitors that you have, you have over 200,000 visitors annually. How do you arrange for 200,000 plus people to experience this institution given its, its tiny, tiny footprint? We have, the, uh, we have extraordinarily sophisticated uh, uh, a ticketing systems. I mean, that's a simple way to start. The and you year. have to manage traffic, so we it's a logistical. We manage traffic. traffic. Yeah. It's like uh, it's like working inside of a bus station. Uh, there are but groups going through that have intimate experiences. We're the ones who see the the moving parts, but we offer sixty or so tours a day. Uh, each capped at. Uh, at, at no more than 15 visitors. Some are capped at, at less than that. Uh, people, visitors, many believe they're just coming to a museum, uh, but they've got to literally enroll in a very specific tour at a very specific moment. The Met, uh, for example, runs 20,000 public programs a year. That's just extraordinary. We run 18,000 public programs a year on somewhat less of a, a physical footprint. And less of a budget. And uh, with a fraction of the budget. So we, we do this with, uh, with great care and with concern that our visitors get an experience that touches them. So if you were to look at TripAdvisor, uh, which ranks, or through which rather, uh, visitors rank over 800 New York attractions. The Tenement Museum consistently ranks in the top 25, but the only other museums that rank at that level are the Met, the Frick, 9-11, and the Cloisters. That we need to uh, we need to be very careful that the experience we offer that we offer keeps us in that rank. But it's more important than just the rank because we want to touch our visitors. Our goal is to have them understand the importance of immigration and an experience that's not good, an experience that's not what we're capable of offering, really undercuts 
the reason the, that the institution exists. So in order to keep the organization financially robust in service to its mission, you have to consider how things work financially. How do you ensure that this organization remains as strong as it can in service to that mission? We have a staff of uh, 150. Uh, we've got a budget of uh, just, just under $9 million. We generate uh, about 70% of our operating costs through earned revenue. Uh, we can do that uh, despite the fact that we're, we're doing good, uh, we know that we have to do well. We have to give people an experience that they're willing to, to tell their friends and neighbors about. We uh, uh, operate through word of mouth as opposed to through, through, uh, general, through general marketing. The way we can do good is to make sure that our tours, our program, operate at an extraordinarily high level. The effort we put into hiring staff, into uh, training them, into mentoring them, into monitoring them, into evaluating them on an ongoing basis, uh, the work we do into the work we do in constantly retraining and upping the education of our staff members. We run seminars uh, twice, three times a week for the staff members doing tours. They don't all take each one, but at a, at a level that, uh, that really the equivalent of, of, graduate, of graduate education. And, and then beyond that, if it turns out we've, we've uh, not hired appropriately, uh, if it turned out turns out we haven't trained appropriately, doing what it requires to move people on into uh, to help them see that, the, their, that their future and ours don't necessarily overlap. All of that's extremely expensive, but it's through those expenses that we, by, by incurring those expenses and knowing what the return is on them, understanding that this is that there are returns that we have in mind that we can be successful. The other thing about our program is that we constantly sharpen and focus on what it is that we deliver, on what message that we, we present, on, on what stories we tell. Uh, we've had a non, not-for-profit consultancies from the Harvard Business School Community Partners Group here in New York. And, and I remember years ago when, when I got started at the museum, it was the first consultancy we brought in, and uh, they said that th there were some things we did so well that we could claim to do them better than anyone else in the world. And we should do only those things where we could make the case that we were doing them better than anyone else in the world. So what is next for the Tenement Museum? Well, on December the 21st, 2014, President Obama signed legislation uh, that uh, creates one, 103 Orchard Street, uh, the building where we now have our visitor center and our education center, that turns that into a national historic site and it does so, uh, and both houses of Congress pass this, it's how a bill becomes a law. Uh, uh, the Congress passed this, the President signed it, because we've been uh, discovering the stories of immigrants who lived in that building in the years after World War II, in the period when our original tenement at 97 Orchard Street had already been closed by the city of New York. Uh, what we have found in that building is, is extraordinary. Uh, we found in the 1950s a family of Holocaust survivors who were allowed into the United States under an emergency directive that President Truman signed in December 1945 that allowed a thousand survivors of the death camps into the United States as a makeup for United States complicity in the Holocaust for the fact that the United States had closed its doors in 1924 through the Johnson-Reed Act 
that had cut off immigration from Eastern uh, and, and Southern Europe. We will be the only museum that tells the story of the lives that survivors made in this country. Morris Vogel, thank you so much for sharing your experience with us, and thank you very much for your insight. Thank you.